Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Hello, alias. Oh, hello. Hello to you people over here. I'm just gonna do the whole show to you. Yeah, wouldn't that be awesome? Fuck them. Fuck all of you. Hi, you guys are cute. <laughs> Hi. I'm gonna talk like this the whole show, is that okay? I just like to do a totally offensive stereotype of a Mexican. <laughs> There's a Mexican at the border. Just let me in! <sighs> Jesus. They won't let us, you guys are dicks in there. <laughs> Fuck you, America. Yeah, I don't know what he said. <laughs> this is a very comfortable way to stand. I like to stand like this. Sometimes I stand like this. This isn't comfortable, but it's a tiny bit entertaining. <laughs> because it makes people look at you, I don't know why that bothers me, that's a little weird. I mean, it's not crazy, like, standing like this, and it's not normal, it's just a little... You see people looking at you, what is it, why is he? I do that when I have to go to places I don't like to go, you know, like CVS. I hate CVS, but sometimes you gotta go in there. That should be their slogan. <laughs> CVS, sometimes you gotta come in here. Where else are you gonna get your wart band-aids? <laughs> and that stuff for your dry vagina. <laughs> dry vagina. I used to think it was I used to think it was called a vagina when I was a kid because I grew up in Boston. <laughs> Shut up. I don't care. In Boston, they have something they call the Boston accent. It's not an accent. It's a whole city full of people pronouncing most words wrong. It's a regionally agreed upon stupidity. And I was raised to talk like an idiot in Boston because the teachers talk like that and they teach you to talk like that. I remember my fifth grade teacher when we did sex ed, she was like this, she was like a diagram, she was like, this is a penis. And this is a vagina. <laughs> now, tearing in a cross, the man ejaculates sperm into the vagina. And then later, a fucking baby comes out of the vagina. And sometimes it's retarded. Yeah. Sad when they come all mentally retarded. <laughs> I grew up in the 70s and teachers said retarded. Some people are retarded. And they got retarded vaginas. <laughs> I really did think it was called a vagina, and because sex is such a mysterious thing to a boy. I thought it was like a thing that you use to vagine with. I gotta, I gotta go to rent a tool and get a vaginer so I could vagine my driveway. I just made a really nice table. I gotta vagine it. That would make a nice table. You make a new table and you sand it and you're like, all right, honey, get up there and she just And you're like, ooh, you don't even a poly or anything, that's nice. That's like the old way to do it, you know? This table is a very smooth because my wife have a very juicy boozy and she, uh, she been a giant at the table is a long time. That is nice, wow. Thank you, Mr. Tedesco Latinioni. Anyway.
anyway. I'm 47 years old and, uh, all right, that's no, that's no, no. There's no, nothing, 47 is not a year, nothing happens. 18, you can vote, 21, you can drive, 47, you get to be out of breath. You get to just kind of stand there. And you know what I realize is taking a huge amount of my breath? It's this, this is like, this is demanding blood and oxygen for my system. Do you know that when you make fat inside of you, you also make vessels and things that feed it. And every breath you take, like a, a quarter of it goes to just this worthless shit. And this, I've had it so long. It's like, a, it's like a prosciutto now. It's just hardened. And it's this thing in my blood. I can, I can feel my heart like trying to feed it. Oh. Ah. My arm's like, could I get some blood ever? <laughs> My heart's like, I can't do it, man. I got it. <laughs> <coughs> Fuck you, you're no help. All you do is jack them off and hold the remote. <laughs> my heart and my arm are not friends. I don't care. I used to want to get in shape, and I'm so glad to let that go. It's a huge relief to forget about that. Because my whole life I've been like, I really should get in shape though. Like I should just start tomorrow and really work hard and do crunches. And then get really, come on. And the next day I'm like, ah, I'm still not doing it. <laughs> but sometime around last year I was like, don't do it, man. Don't do it, don't want to do it. And I don't. My only goal for my health is this. I want to be healthy enough and in good enough shape that if you find out that I died, you ask what happened. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> when I die, I want you to wonder how I died. I don't want you to just go, yeah, well, sure he is. Yeah, of course he's dead. Of course he's dead. The only shock at this point is if you find, oh my God, he's still alive? Oh my God. Oh my God, how? Some things change when you get older, you know? Like, uh, I've reallocated some of the noises that I make. Like, the noise I used to make when I come is now the noise I make when I pee. Uh, 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 oh, 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 fuck, yeah, yeah, ah. Uh. Take it all, bitch. <laughs> I'm very disrespectful to my toilet. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, bitch, you like that, don't you? I'm gonna shit in your mouth, too, because you ain't nothing but a shitty, piss drinking tell it. Dumb bitch, tell it. Got my piss on your lips. You ain't intelligent. What do you do? You sit there all day on your ass, waiting for me to shit in your face. Dumb bitch, tell it. Puh. You ain't even special. I pissed in three toilets today. <laughs> shit. Quit crying. I love you. It's bad. Well, that's how my dad treated his toilet, so that's where I learned it. Anyway, that's the noise I make when I pee. Some of you might be wondering, none of you are wondering, <laughs> what noise do I make when I come? Okay, so this is the noise I make when I come. It's not that special, I just go like this. <laughs> It is done! It's a whole thing with a cloud with funnels of... Ah! The crows come and there's lightning. The circle is complete! Ah! 
and there's a little witch floating with white eyes. <laughs> and a child will be born, and then, ah! And I don't know, it's kind of intense. And some kid throws a lightning bolt at me, and I go, ah! And I go to sleep for a thousand years. It's a... I don't know, when guys come, they like to talk about it. We like to tell you. I remember one time I was with this woman, and we were having sex for the first time. It was our first time together. It was also our last time, but I didn't know <laughs> at the time that it was going to be our last time. You don't know it's going to be your last time until some time goes by. And you're like, yeah, I guess that was it. <laughs> it's rare that you know while you're doing it. And she's like, I'm not doing this again. Like, while you're fucking... <laughs> Just see so you now, this is definitely the last time. I completely regret this fuck right now. That's a bad, that's a bad kind of a fuck. The kind that turns into a rape halfway through. <laughs> mm. Anyway, I was with this woman. We're having sex. And I was gonna come, and I felt like talking about it. But it was our first time together, so I was a little hesitant. You know, when you're with somebody a bunch of times and you're in love, then you just go, ah, baby, I gotta fucking come! Ah, shit! I gotta fucking, ah! Just let it out. But I didn't really know her, so I was like, I'm probably, probably gonna, it's probably gonna come. I just feel like this I mean, it's coming, it's most likely. She's like, what is this, what? No, I just think I, I come, coming, gonna. Okay, I get it. Go ahead. Because I'm back there. Just, that's why she's got it. back there. <clears throat> I'm always back there. So they don't see me crying. <clears throat> I get a little paranoid having sex with a woman from behind because you don't know what's really going on. Can't see her face. I don't know how she completely feels. The whole time she might be like... I've been doing comedy for about uh, 30 years or something like that. It's been a long time. All right. <clears throat> Shouldn't take that long to get good at it. Shouldn't take that long. It's really a simple thing. You talk to people. I should have figured it out right away. But it took me a long time, and I used to hate it. I really did. First few years, I hated it because I bombed almost every show. And I remember when I started, I was like, I want to make people laugh. And for a good five years, I didn't make one fucking person laugh. And I realized, now I don't make people laugh because I'm a comedian. I used to make people laugh. I work in a garage, and I used to make people laugh. And it was just a plus. It was just, hey, that guy at the garage, he's funny. But if the guy at the garage isn't funny, you don't go, that guy, what a piece of shit, he wasn't funny. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. I've traveled all over the country. I remember one time I worked at this club in North Carolina. I don't remember what town. It was called like, uh, you know, bleh, 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 North Carolina. I don't know. Just, uh, <laughs> did that clear in the day. North Carolina. See, I'm there, I'm going to down. Dang, I'm my daddy. It's actually in South Carolina. <laughs> anyway, I'm in bleh, 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 North Carolina. And I'm working at this club, I don't remember what it's called, it was called something like, like, I'm, like you're gonna kill yourself in a week. Uh, <laughs> and the owner of the club comes up to me, and he says, uh, so, uh, what's your shots policy? And I said, what? And he said, what's your shots policy? And I was like, this doesn't help. 
I need sentences. So he says, well, sometimes when a guy's on stage and the audience likes him, they want to send a shot up there and have him drink it. And everybody goes, woo. He goes, now, you want me to send you a shot of real booze or like a shot with something else in it so you don't, you know, have to drink the booze? And I said, uh, yeah, you know what? Don't send anything. And he goes, well, what do I say to them if they want to send you a shot? I said, tell them, no, you may not. No, you mayn't interrupt the show by sending a fucking glass of something to the guy. And he's like, well, they're going to be upset. I was like, okay, let them feel that way. What kind of entitled people are these? If you go to a football game, you're like, send the quarterback a banjo. <laughs> like to see him play a banjo right about now. Not Carolina. I was, in, uh, I was in an airplane, and we were about to take off, and the flight attendant comes on and he says, folks, we have a special announcement. Our pilot, Captain Davis, this is his last flight. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to t tell us. You can keep that to yourself. I'm not excited. Guess what? You're on the bleeding edge of his competence. <laughs> he can barely do this anymore. His hands are shaking like crazy. We're gonna make him stop after this one more time with you. We live in an interesting time, you know, because you can be on a plane, you're one person on an airplane out of 200 passengers or whatever, and you're sitting on the flight, and you're 30,000 feet in the air in the middle of the flight. If you just decide to do this, you just sit there, and you just start going, Mwah! Seriously, if you start doing that on an airplane and then don't stop doing it, they will land the plane. You can will a plane to the ground without a weapon or a threat. You don't even need to do that much. You can just sit there, you just start saying, down. 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 Seriously, if you're on an airplane and you just start saying the word down at slightly above conversational volume. Down. Down. Sir, so is there a problem? Down. Down. A squadron of F-16s will appear in the window and they will force the plane to the ground and you'll be in a lot of trouble. I guess, but how much? What can they really do to you? They can't make you go to prison because you said the word down several times. Sir, why'd you do that? Are you a terrorist? No, I just um, didn't like up at the moment. And so I said the word opposite, so I just felt like it. So, you didn't have to do it. You guys are fucking weirdos. I was on a plane once and there was two babies on the plane and other people. <laughs> it wasn't just me and two babies. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> You're going somewhere, you get on the plane, there's just two babies. <laughs> They're just standing there. Come on, we're leaving. <laughs> He's the pilot baby. I'm the other baby. <laughs> no, that's right, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna get on the plane. No, you babies have a good flight. I just, uh, I'm gonna find another way to get there. I don't like the way this flight is starting. All right, here's a real story. <laughs> I was on a plane, there were two babies on a plane. They were both crying. I don't think they knew each other, they just were both crying. <laughs> I've been on a lot of planes with crying babies and I started to wonder, is there a reason? 
the babies cry in planes. And I looked it up, it turns out there is a specific reason why babies cry in airplanes, and it's because they're upset that gay people are getting married. <laughs> yeah. And I don't agree with them. I think if you're in love, you should do whatever you want. I don't think these babies should be trying to force their values on other people. But they don't, they don't get it, they're babies, they're being babies. I have two children, and they've both been babies on planes, crying. I've held a crying baby on a plane more than once. And I see people get upset, and I and really, my sympathy for them is pretty marginal. Because when people are so selfish, when a baby starts to cry on your plane, you feel like that's happening to you. Like, this is gonna ruin my flight! Well, take a look at the parent. Because this is somebody who's holding a crying baby right on their own face. Okay, which means, by the way, they've been traveling with a baby all day. Which means, by the way, they have a baby. So their life isn't even good. They don't like anything. Nobody that has a baby likes anything anymore. They just walk around, oh, oh, okay, fine, ah, shit, oh. People are like, it's beautiful, yeah, whatever, yes. Yeah. The only joy in a baby haver's life is when it's crying on a plane and it's now bothering other people. Yeah, you listen to this shit for a minute. Wah! I used to walk around the plane, eh, huh? Wah! What are you, 20 years old? Listen to this shit. Wah! People look at you when your baby's crying. They look right at you like, I fucking love it, I love it. I love when they do that. I'm like, huh, hi, hi. Yeah. I remember this one time, this businessman, businessmen are amazing because when they fly, they feel like the whole plane is their private plane that we all glommed on or something. This guy's reading the Wall Street Journal and my baby's crying, my baby's so upset. And the guy looks right at me, right in the face, like, hmm? Hmm. Like, could ya? What? Oh, I'm sorry, is this bothering you? Let me just... You all just clap for a dead baby. <laughs> I have two daughters. One is 10 and one is 13. They're both gay. I'm raising them gay. It's my choice. Most people raise their kids straight. I'm raising mine gay. We're starting out at gay. They can do whatever they want later on. But as long as they're in my house. I keep a strict gay household. I tell them every night, Hi, good night, honey, you're gay, okay? You're gay. That's right. Brush your gay teeth, honey. Good night, gay, honey. You're gay. Daddy loves you as long as you're gay. My youngest daughter really likes dolls, and she has an American Girl doll. Uh, her mom bought it for her, I wouldn't have bought her that shit. Bunch of rubber sh fucking crap. I don't know if you're aware of American Girl dolls, but American Girl dolls are these rubber dolls, and they have, all, they have outfits, and they have accessories. It's kind of an amazing world. And I was in California with my kids, and I took my daughter to the American Doll the American Girl doll uh, mecca, it's this store, and it's like, a, it's like a, a museum of the dolls, you know? And they show you what each doll has. There's all these different dolls with different personalities, you know? There's Caroline, and Caroline is a princess, but she really hangs out with the poor folks, you know? It's always like... 
This one lives in a mansion, but she just thinks it's silly because she's cool. And they have all these accessories. They have, a, they have horses, these beautiful horses. I was a grown man and I'm like petting this toy horse. That's, hey boy, that's okay, boy. They have bicycles, like a nice fucking bike. Like a bike that if you were this big, you could totally ride it. It's got a chain with oil, it's a fucking bike. Amazing shit. And I'm looking at all the dolls and their different personalities, and the one on the end, there's one black doll. They make one black American girl doll. And I'm like, oh fuck, I don't wanna, I don't wanna see how that's different. I just don't want to know. Please let them have just made it the same. Couldn't they have just taken whatever chocolate rubber and poured it in the same mold and give them all the same cool shit? So I go in there into the room for the black doll. It's Addie the black doll. That's not what they call her. <laughs> it's Addie the black doll. She's just Addie. She's black. I go in there, and there's Addie, and, and guess what she gets to have? Guess what her accessories are? She has a bucket. That's it! She has one whole bucket. Go to the fucking store and add, just call me a liar. You will see a little black doll sitting on a shitty wooden bed with a ripped quilt on it, and she's just looking at a bucket. That's all she has. It's shocking. Caroline has a silver hairbrush and a sleigh. Addie gets a fucking bucket. Who's buying this doll? Who would want to buy that doll? Who's taking their black daughter and come on, this one's for you. Look in here. Look what she has. She gets a bucket. I, well, can I get the bicycle from the... Uh, no, 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 no. That's Caroline's bicycle. Who is this for? The only kid that could possibly want this doll is a mean little white girl that wants to buy a black doll and say, you only get a bucket. My daughter, my little one, she's a great kid. She tap dances. She likes tap dancing. We figured it, we should have her start tap dancing because by the time she grows up, it'll be the 1930s again. <laughs> and she'll have this thing she can do that nobody enjoys watching. <laughs> you know what the audience is for tap dancing? The parents of tap dancing children. That's who's watching it. They do a big show at the end of the tap dancing school semester and all the kids get up there and they dance, the whole school. They get up there in groups of threes. There's about 6,000 kids. And they do about 20 minutes each. So the show's about seven months long. And everybody dies at the end. But you go because you want to see your kid tap dance. Who wouldn't want to see that? Watching your child tap dance is an amazing event because this was a baby. She was a baby once. This was, she was just like this. That's it. And now she's going like this. But in order to watch that, you have to sit through all these other kids that you don't love at all. In fact, you hate them for not being your kid and making you wait. These kids face a whole audience of just two people that love them, and then everybody's just, get the fuck off, you fat little bitch. Hurry up! <laughs> and there's grown-ups. There's adults that take classes at the school, and they get up there and they tap dance. I'm like, get off, get off! Nobody's here to see you. You're 52, your parents are dead. Get off the stage. <laughs> Nobody came to see you. Nobody came from work. Nobody came from work. <laughs> Nobody who you approached. Hey, so I'm taking tap dancing lessons lately. 
Yeah? Yeah, I really like it. Okay, it's great. Yeah, so anyway, we're doing a show at my school on Saturday. Do you want to go to it? Seriously, can you give me tickets? I'm dying to see that. Really? How long you been? Three months? Fuck, I can't wait. That's my favorite thing that'll ever happen to me. I take my daughter every Thursday to the tap school. I take her in there, put her in the tap shoes. She goes in the tap room. I sit in the waiting room. And I wait there because it's only 40 minutes. It's not enough time for me to go anywhere. So I just sit there and I listen through the wall. <laughs> and then she comes out, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. Good, don't. I don't want to bring you. I don't care if you do it. Quit. Quit now. I don't push my kids with the activities. I don't get that because you got to do the shit too. I don't care what she does. Daddy, I'm tired of soccer. Soccer is out of our lives forever. With those words from thine mouth. Don't do anything, honey. I don't care. Don't go to school. I don't want to get up at seven. You don't need it. I have money. Just stay home and eat the food in the house. Just stay home and eat. You and your sister don't have kids, we're, and then we're just, we, all three of us die. We're done. That's my goal. I just want to have enough money that we can lock the door and eat the food till we're all dead. Daddy, what are we doing today? Go to the food room and pick something out. Go back to bed. It's all that's required of you. People complicate this life shit. You know, folks get all twisted up trying to figure out their life. I don't know what to do with my life. You know? Just like a general, like, what do I do, like, with my life? You know? Just put food in here. That's it. That's it. Walk around and look for food. Just look for food. Anytime you see any food, just take it and put it in your mouth. Then when you feel pressure in your ass, shit out the shit inside of your ass. If anybody tries to stop you from doing either of those two things, murder them. <laughs> Do that until your body stops doing things. And then you're dead. I wonder how long I'm gonna live. Sometimes I wonder, like, how old am I gonna get? You never get to find out. You, ne you never get to know how long you lived. Everybody else knows except for you. Because you never get to say, okay, I'm dead, so 85. <laughs> you don't get to have that thought. You never get to think, ah, that's it, I'm done. You get to think, this is your last thought. You get to think, this is probably it. <laughs> that's everybody's last thought. This totally feels like it, this is it right here. <laughs> Most people get to be 80. That's the average lifespan of an American but we've got medical technology and research that we're putting in to make it go longer. We would like to live longer, wouldn't we? We'd like to live to 85. Five more years, wouldn't that be great? Well, let's be clear what you're getting there, though. You're getting five more years of life at the end. They go at the end. They don't shove over the old years and stick five cool new young years in the middle. You don't get new. Now I get to be 28, 29, and also 20 flidgetoos and flinching the boo. No, you get to be almost dead for five more years. You get to be like, ah, uncomfortably old. That kind of old where you don't even have a wallet anymore. Where's my wallet? Well, where are you going? What are you talking about? We threw your wallet away years ago. 
What are you gonna go to the diarrhea store? You got plenty of free diarrhea here. Some people get to be 90. That's incredible. Anybody that gets to be 90, I think that's special. Because 90 means you survived like three wars and 50 hurricanes. You gotta be special when you're 90. When I see somebody who's 90, I'm like, you, you did some shit. You killed somebody. You did something. How'd you get this far? 90 special. You should get something for being 90. It shouldn't just be the same shit. It should just keep being just as hard. When you get to 90, couldn't that be some kind of a finish line? Some kind of like a, all right, here, you get a silver thing on you and you get to, you know, take it easy. Give him some Gatorade, you know, give him a back rub. <laughs> Fuck, he's 90. But it's not like that. It's like, you know, eh, happy birthday, you're 90, pay the fucking rent, it just keeps going. I mean, 90-year-olds shouldn't have to worry about anything. If you get that far, and we could absorb that as a nation, there's not that many people that are 90. We could just let them do what they want. My friend's grandmother, she's 90 years old, and she wants to get marijuana because she's in pain, but she's in a state that won't let her. How is any drug illegal for a 90-year-old lady? Let her have anything she wants. It's a victimless crime. Who the fuck is getting hurt? When your 90-year-old grandmother has a bag of heroin in the house and she's like, ugh, fucking yeah. Who's getting hurt? Give her a bag of heroin. You're not gonna go see her. Give her a bag of heroin. I mean, I've never tried heroin, but from what I've heard, it, it's, it's, it feels really fucking good. But it has a huge downside. But if you're 90, the downside, it's gone. It cannot hurt you if you're 90. What are you worried about? She, oh, she's gonna ruin her career. She can't give her heroin. She's just gonna want more heroin. Well, get her more heroin then. And keep giving it to her. If you're 90, you should be allowed to just like walk in a store and just take shit and just walk out. Let her have it. She'll be dead in a week, you'll get it back. <laughs> at some point, I mean, everybody dies at some point. I hope I'm not breaking that to anybody here. <laughs> it's an interesting thing about human beings. We grow up with the knowledge that we're going to die. We live with it. We live our whole lives knowing that it's going to end. I think that takes courage. I, I admire us for being able to do that. Other animals don't do that. Other living beings, they don't think about, well, fuck, I mean, I, mean, I might as well, I don't know why I'm gonna die. They just do whatever they do. You know, they live in the moment. You ever seen a dog sneeze? Whenever a dog sneezes, first of all, their whole world explodes. And when the sneeze is over, they don't know anything anymore. They gotta start their whole education from scratch. You ever seen a dog walk in a room looking pretty intelligent? Hey, everybody. <laughs> the fuck? But we know we're gonna die. I found out when I was seven years old that everybody dies. My grandfather told me. He said, everybody dies! I wasn't even talking to him. <laughs> I was just trying to blow out the candles. <laughs> yeah, I was seven years old, and I suddenly had this knowledge that everybody dies, that life ends for all of us. And I remember I was excited. I was. I wasn't excited to die, I was excited that I know this thing. And I was seven and I knew other kids my age didn't know it. And I wanted to tell them. I wanted to be the person that tells people that everybody dies. I remember having that thought. And the first person I wanted to tell was Benji, this kid across the street. And I wanted to tell him because I hated him. I really did. I hated Benji. He was six and I was seven. And I wasn't friends with him. I would just, anytime I came out to my front yard, he'd come out to his, hi. And I hated him. He's the first person I ever hated. 
To me, he was a, he was a piece of shit cocksucker. That's how I felt about him. And I didn't even know those words. I, I was seven, I didn't know how to talk like that. I, so I would just look at him and uh, I would just feel that way without a name for it. And then one day I heard some guy yell, piece of shit cocksucker, and I was like, yes, that's, thank you. That's exactly what I feel about that child. Anyway, one day I'm in my front yard and piece of shit cocksucker Benji comes out in his little shorts. And I was like, ugh. Comes out to me, he starts bragging. He's like, I got a new bike. And I was like, really? You're gonna die someday. He's like, what? Like, you're gonna die, Benji. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. He goes, how do you know? I said, because everybody dies, Benji. You're gonna die. And your mom's gonna die. <laughs> and your daddy's gonna die. In that order. <laughs> anyway, he started crying. And he starts running back. It's still funny to me after 40 fucking years. I still remember it so well. Little Benji running into his house. Run, Benji! You can't run from this shit, bitch. <laughs> he ran in his house, and then he came back out with his mother. And his mom's got his little hand, and she's furious. And I was scared. She walks up, she says, what did you say to Benji? I said, I told him that everybody dies. She said, why did you say that? I said, because it's true. And she said, well, not necessarily. I was like, what? <laughs> she says, well, some people die and some people don't. So you never know, you might make it. <laughs> make it to what? And my head was spinning. I was like, wait a minute. So I'm like, I have so many questions for her. I was like, wait a minute. What about people from the Bible? I mean, they're all gone. What about Abraham Lincoln? He died. She's like, well, somebody shot Abraham Lincoln. But if they hadn't and he took care of himself, he might still be around today. I was like, really? And all of a sudden she goes, well, we have to go. And she just takes off. Like she walked away very quickly because I think she realized she, was, she picked the wrong argument to get on this side of. She was not gonna, this was gonna end badly. And I ran inside and I told my mother the whole thing. My mother said, don't talk to that lady. She's a fucking idiot, don't talk to that lady. <laughs> fucking hate that lady, don't talk to her. My mom said to me, baby, don't worry. You're definitely going to die. <laughs> I had to talk to my kids about death recently because our dog died, so I had to tell them. You know, it's a sad thing when your dog dies and you gotta tell the kids. I mean, you gotta tell them. You gotta tell them at some point. You can't just keep going, wait, wait, wait there he goes, what? Wait, oh, wait a minute, he was right here. Where'd he go, that little scamp, he's a quick one. Go after him, there he goes. <laughs> it's a sad thing when you gotta tell your kids that the dog is dead, but I had to tell them. And you know what, I was proud of them. I was proud of them, how they, how they owned their feelings about it. They cried, they talked about the dog. And I thought, you know what? This was a positive thing. That's how you start thinking as a parent. It's sad that your dog died, but it was an opportunity. You got to talk about death with the kids. It's like a dry run for grandma. <laughs> it is. It is, and it's a positive thing. And if you're a parent, you have to view it that way. It's a good thing. Your dog dies, you get to deal with death with your kids. And then whatever, like a few months later, you're like, so you know all that stuff we talked about? About the dog? Yeah, so grandma now. <laughs> all the same stuff. All right, you got it? Okay, I'm going out, good night. I had a dog when I was a kid. My dog hated me. It was one of the saddest things about my life. 
I wanted a dog so badly, I was about 10 years old, and I begged my mother for a dog. And she didn't want to give me one because I was a messy, shitty little kid. She said, if we get a dog, it's going to be disgusting in here, because it's already disgusting, because you're a smelly, disgusting little boy. She didn't say all that. But that's how she looked at me my whole childhood. So one day, my mother finally said to me, I'm going to make a deal with you. She said, you can get a dog if you keep your room clean for one month. And I was like, hallelujah, I'm getting a dog. I told everybody at school, I'm getting a dog, because I knew I was going to get a dog, because all I had to do was clean my room for one month. So I cleaned my room, I kept it clean for about two weeks, and then it just went to shit. It was disgusting, there was just shit smeared on the walls, it was gross. Then I tried again, three, four days maybe, fucking horrible again. And I remember thinking, I'm 10 years old and I already know my life is gonna be horrible. Because I can't do a thing to get a thing. I should kill myself right now. And finally my mom was like, well get a dog, Jesus, you're bumming everybody out. So she got us a dog and the dog hated me. And it hurt because I took care of the dog. I was very kind to the dog, but he hated me. So he must have just hated who I am inside. And you could tell how he felt because he was a very expressive dog. He was a terrier, you know, he had eyebrows. He had a very expressive face. I would walk in the room and the dog would go like, oh fuck, I can't, I gotta, I gotta go. Doggy. We go for walks and I had to use a leash and I didn't want to use the leash. I want to be one of those cool guys with a dog that just comes along. Hey, dog, come on. You know, it's always some guy with like a suede jacket and scruffy hair. He's got an old pickup truck and he gets in and he goes, come on, dog. And he goes, Phoosh. you know those guys that can whistle, that cool whistle that I can't whistle, Woo! or whatever. And the dog jumps in and they both get laid somewhere because this guy is so cool. That's what I wanted. But I would walk my dog and I had to have a leash and the leash was like taut. It wasn't even like, we're cool, we're friends. It was like, how far can I get my face from this child? He would choke himself the whole walk. I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! And if I ever stumbled and dropped the leash, he was like, he was gone. He would go, I'm not your dog. And he would just, he would run like a slave. He would just disappear. That's how we ran, it's an apt description. I'm just being accurate. He didn't run like a deer, this is how deers run. My dog ran like this. He ran away about 20 times. And then we get a call from the dog pound, hi, we have your dog. You can hear my dog in the background going, don't. Fucking kid's gonna come back and get me. <laughs> yeah, I don't judge my mom though, you know? She did the best she could, she raised us, you know? She didn't have a lot of money. My mom would take us shopping, she would always buy the shittiest crackers. The worst, she would buy us these saltine crackers with no salt on them. <laughs> like they were saltless saltine crackers. And you could tell they actually made them saltines and then used a credit card and scraped off the salt. And I would say to my mom, why do you buy those? They're disgusting. She said, well, then you won't eat them and they'll last longer. If I buy the good crackers, they'll be gone in three days. But the, but the bad ones last for weeks. What the fuck kind of way is that to raise a kid? Just give them wood chips and... <laughs> it's tough, man. It's hard being a parent. It's really complicated having kids. So shut up. Don't do it. You're boring. My, my kids, my daughter just figured out lying. And that's an interesting thing. It's an interesting place to be. She's figured out how to lie. My nine-year-old, 10-year-old, doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> really doesn't. It really doesn't. I look at her face, I don't give a shit what age she is. She's that. When she lies, I, I know she's lying. Because all kids suck at lying. 
But when she, I don't really know what to do about it, to be honest with you. Because I want her to be an honest child, but I also want her to have a good life. And I get lying. I get it. I do it all the time. And I have since I was her age, so I totally get it. When she lies, it's because she's in trouble. That's why kids lie. Little kids, little nine-year-old kids, they don't lie because of some weird Machiavellian, you know. Do you know what my teacher said about you? It's interesting. Like, she's not trying to start some shit. Kids lie because they're in trouble. Because trouble is too much for a kid. Kids can't take trouble. We're grown-ups. When we're in trouble, we just go, oh, sorry. Oh, am I in trouble now? Whoops. But for a little nine-year-old kid, trouble is like a monster just... Did you take the chocolate? <laughs> Did you take it? No. Well, all right then, have a nice day. How do you then tell her, yeah, don't apply that perfect method ever again to terrifying moments of your life? Mark Twain once said, a man who always tells the truth doesn't have to remember what he said. Mark Twain said that, that's pretty cool. But Mark Twain also said, there once was a big black guy named Nigger Jim, so. I don't know if 100% of the things Mark Twain said were perfectly awesome. I mean, seriously, Mark, you couldn't come up with a better name than Nigger Jim. Well, it's got a nice ring to it. Yeah, but it's kind of on the nose, ain't it? My other daughter's 13, she just turned 13. And those are the years, those are the, where the parents ahead of you are like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, wait till she can. <laughs> That's when you get the baby. <laughs> That's what they actually say. It's really confusing. I'm not scared of my daughter being 13. Some guys, they're literally afraid of their teenagers. They're like, she's, she, I don't know what she won't. Hi, hi, she won't do anything. She won't do anything I tell her to do. It is fucked up talking to a teenager. Because you're like, honey, you got to do your homework. Nah. Okay, you got to do it though. I'm not going to do it. Okay, well, I'm making you do it now. Well, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, will you do it later? Are you, when will you do it? I don't know. Okay, well, I'm gonna move out. So you do it when you want. Because this one thing is, that's it, I'm done. It's, it's a little fucked up. I love my kids, though. And it, she's 13, she's weird now, and I still love her. A lot of guys, they really freak out when their daughters get older. Like, my friend's daughter is 16, he's like, I don't know what to do. She's going to start having sex. I don't know what to do. She's going to have sex now. What do I do? I'm like... You don't do anything. That's not your area. You're the dad. You have no role in her sex life. None. Not advisory or supportive. Nothing. But what if she has a bad sexual experience? Oh, she's going to have a number of those. Oh, yeah. She's going to have some of those. Her whole life is going to be just walking through a blizzard of bad dicks that just keep... <laughs> ah, shit! <laughs> All that dicks... Shit, that's a... Look, bro. Just trying to get to work. Yeah, man.
They're coming. The dicks are coming. It's a whole cloud of dicks. Get the pussies in the barn. The dicks are coming. Just a storm of dicks. <laughs> you know, I was watching The Wizard of Oz the other day, and because <laughs> that was a, a storm of dicks, you know, that was a tornado of dicks. Dorothy! Fuck. I really was watching The Wizard of Oz the other day, and uh, there was this moment that really freaked me out. I'd never noticed it before. It's, uh, I don't know if you saw The Wizard of Oz. It's about a little girl named Dorothy. She's played by an alcoholic older lady. And she lives in Kansas, and she has a little dog, and she's like, my dog, help everybody. And all the grown-ups are like, this is a farm. It's the Depression. We have things to do. Anyway, so there's a tornado, and uh, everybody goes inside, like immediately. They just leave her. It's so traumatizing. When I was a kid watching this, because they didn't give a shit, Annie M was like, Dorothy! Okay, fuck it. And she just goes right inside, and they bolt the door. And Dorothy comes like 10 seconds later, and she's going like this, and they're down there going, nah, man, you're the weakest link. Goodbye. Anyway, she goes to Oz, and there's this moment that really this one time, I've seen it a lot of times, but it's when Ray Bulger plays the Scarecrow. He gets very upset, and he has this moment where he goes way over the top, even for this movie. It's when he gets torn apart by flying monkeys. And the Tin Man comes over and he goes, what happened? And he says, well, first they tore my arms off, and they threw them over there. And then they tore my legs off, and I threw them over there! I've seen this movie like a thousand times, but for some reason this time when I got to that moment, I was like, holy shit, what was that? The fuck is he doing? And I wondered if, like, Victor Fleming, who directed the movie, if he had any moment during the filming where he was like, I think I need to have a word with Ray. Because that's getting to be a lot. All right, let him do one more. Action! What happened? Well, first they tore my arms off, and I threw them over there! And then they tore my... All right, cut! Oh, shit. <sighs> Listen, um... Ray... Yes? Uh, you know, you're fine. <laughs> Just keep doing it. Fucking pain in my ass. <laughs> I was, uh, I was in the, I love the country. I was, I don't like the country. I hate the country. Why do I even say that? <laughs> I really hate it. I hate the country. You know what I hate are creatures that aren't like, you know, like, I, there are certain things, like bats. I really hate bats. I hate bats very much. Bats are disgusting to me. Bats are mice with leather wings. And they fly around and they look at shit. It's like somebody, you know? They have a face. Birds don't bother me, because that's not a person. A bird is just like... But a bat is like, yeah, fucking, he's like, they're gross, it's disgusting. They have ideas and stuff, it just grosses me out. I really wish that bats would all get a disease and die. I do, that's how I feel. And I'm sure there's a whole thing like, well, did you know that bats make all the French toast in the world or whatever it is? I don't care. I had a terrible experience with a bat. This summer, I was in the country with my kids because I share custody with their mom and I had them for a month and she had them for a month. So I got a house in the country and it was beautiful and the kids loved it. But the kids go to sleep at like 8 o'clock at night. And then I'm just awake. 
just terrified because I hate the dark and the mystery of it. It really upsets me. I live in New York City. I'm surrounded by whatever, murderers and child molesters. It's cozy. I like it. I'm happy here. But I'm out in the country and it's just like, it's just quiet and I just hear little noises. I'm laying in bed like this. And I just, I hear like, what is that? Jesus. That's like, that's a bear with bird feet. So one night I'm laying in bed and I, and usually I hear noises and I get scared, but part of me says, you're cool, it's nothing. But then I heard this thing. This is what I heard, I swear to God, I heard this clear as a bell, I heard, morning. <laughs> And my heart, I was like, I'm gonna die from fear right now. Cause I heard that. There is a witch in the kitchen. First of all, there's witches. There's witches, so no problem with that. I've completely decided that witches exist. And there's one in the kitchen. And I don't know what to, I have to do something. I can't just go, well, they like kids. She'll get the kids. So I go down to the kitchen, and I'm outside of the kitchen like this for like 30 minutes. And then, after almost an hour of being too afraid to go in the kitchen, logic starts seeping in. And a voice says to me, look man, even if there's a witch in the kitchen, she wouldn't make a noise and then just stand there for an hour. <laughs> kind of witch is that? Morning! <laughs> So I go in the kitchen. There's nobody there. And I heard the noise again, and it was the dishwasher. The dishwasher makes that noise. It's got these tubes, and when the suds go through them, it's very vocal for some reason. It goes, hee <laughs> So now I'm like, oh, okay, I'm all right. Now I'm stupid in the other direction. I'm like, there's nothing bad in the whole planet. I'm fine. Nothing ever happens that's bad. So I leave the kitchen, and as I'm walking through the living room, a fucking bat, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, just a fucking bat flies in front of my face. And the worst thing about it is that there's no warning. There's just an indoor bat, and it makes no noise, which is way worse. It's just a silent, it's just, there's a tear in the fucking galaxy. It's just this <laughs> darkness. And I went, ah! And I fell down. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. I fell down and I crawled into the closet and I called 911. <laughs> I don't know if you ever called 911 where you didn't have such a great reason. And you don't realize till you hear the urgency in their voice how so you shouldn't be calling 911 right now. 911, what's your emergency? I'm really sorry. I, sir, what's the problem? There is one bat in my house. And I don't like it. Anyway, she was nice to me, the 911 lady. Because it was country 911. If you call 911 here, there's a bat in my house. Sir, we'll send a car right over to shoot you in the face. But it's country 911, so she's like, sir, I understand you're divorced, you're overcompensating with a country house. It's not gonna fix your kids' lives. You're in over your head. So she gives me this phone number, and she says, call this man. He's a guy, he deals with bats. He's a bat expert. He's a man who knows what to do about bats. It felt like she was working really hard to not say Batman. Because she could, she's like, I'm not gonna fucking say Batman, I feel stupid. It's a human male who bats are his focus. <laughs> Batman. Yeah, okay, fine. So I call the Batman. From the I'm still in the closet. And I'm looking through the little crack, and the bat is like upside down on my ceiling, and he's looking around. Finally, there's a knock at my door, and I crawl to the door, and I open it. The guy's like, hello. 
And he goes, where's the bat? And I go, he's there. So the guy walks over and he just takes the bat. That's it. He just took it. And I paid him $600. I felt so stupid. I felt like I called and said, help, there's a box of tissues on my table. <laughs> oh, thank God. What a relief. What a relief to have a man in the house. Would you like some sweet tea? <laughs> Wasn't expecting company. <laughs> oh, my robe fell open. <laughs> you saw my breasts. <laughs> what are you gonna do now, <laughs> Mr. Batman? What if I kept doing this for like 40 minutes until you stopped laughing? You're not gonna touch my breasts? I didn't take you for a coward when you grabbed that bat so. How about my country southern ass, Mr. Batman? Why don't you just tuck that little bat up in my asshole? You want to, don't you? I know the bat wants to go in there. Go ahead, Mr. Batman. <laughs> Shit. It's sad, it's sad how I had an opportunity there to tell a whole story and I just went for the bat going up my asshole. I think it's a sad, it's a, it's a sign of my limitations. Anyway, that's what happened with the bat. I prefer the city, I do, even though it's weird. My kids get bombarded by strange things, you know? They see all kinds of stuff, big billboards, sex billboards, you know? Calvin Klein, weird chick with a stripe of cotton like this, and she's like this, like, with a weird... The American Apparel girls are like, I have garbage in my pussy. <laughs> so, I put pennies in my vagina. I was on the subway one time, and I'm standing on the subway. I wasn't holding anything, I just like to stand like this. <laughs> this would be a weird kind of aggressive stance to take in New York. It's not quite threatening. But if you just walked around the city like this, people are like, okay, just go ahead, man, fuck. Anyway, I was on the subway, and I, I heard this sound from back here, from behind me. I heard this, I heard And I was like, meh, it's a crazy person. You hear that sometimes. And then I hear it again, I'm like, all right, I wanna look. I wanna see the crazy person. I mean, what's the point of living in this city if you can't fucking take a look <laughs> at the crazy guy? So I look over, and it's not what I expected. It wasn't a big homeless guy with two pairs of headphones that don't work. <laughs> it was a young woman. She looked like she was, like, from Michigan or something. I don't know. Really sweet-looking young woman. She's got a sweater and a, with a collar over it and a ponytail and a little, like, book bag, and she's just standing there. And I'm like, she didn't make that noise. I heard wrong, because she didn't make the noise. And as I'm looking at her, she goes, Brrr! and I'm like, fuck, this is like a dream. This is not the person that usually does that. She did it three more times. Brrr! Brrr! What is happening in the world right now? And then she does this, she goes, la 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 la. La 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 la. And I realize, oh, she's like a music student. 
at like Juilliard or something, I don't know, she was like 20 years old. So she's like just doing her vocal exercises right on the train. And you know what? It wasn't charming <laughs> or nice. It just seemed arrogant to me. Cause she's like, I'm in New York City studying music. And I do my vocal exercises right on the train. La, 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 everybody. La, 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 tired nurse who just did a 14-hour shift. And I was like, well, is it okay if I shave my balls on the subway? Is that okay? I was on the subway platform one time, standing on the platform, waiting for my train, and I look over, and there's two rats, and they're fucking on the platform. <laughs> Never saw that before. Two rats fucking. And I watched them. Because <laughs> you can watch rats fuck, it's not a big deal. You don't have to go like, You can just totally watch them like this, like this. Hmm. Anyway, I watched the rats fuck because I was curious how they do it. It's not, there's nothing surprising about how they do it, by the way. It's not like she's on top going, mm. 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 It was a pretty standard rat fuck. He's on top, smushing her into the pavement, and she's like... <laughs> so I'm watching him. I mean, just, I didn't miss my train, just like while I was there. Because I was curious. I wanted to see what it's like when he comes. That's what I wanted to see. I realized he's gonna come at some point, I want to see what it's like when a boy rat comes. Like, is it, is it just a biological thing? Just like, meh, and then he leaves? Or is it like, oh, fucking, yeah, shit! Is it like, is it like a, like an orgasm? Ugh. I told that story to a, a friend of mine, and she said, well, what about the girl rat? Hmm? Why don't you wonder how she comes? Why don't you empower her and ask yourself about her orgasm? What are you, crazy girl? Rats don't come. There's no way that when rats fuck, the girl gets to come. Because he's not holding out for her. He's not that kind of dude, you could tell. He doesn't give a shit. He's going to come and leave. He doesn't even know her fucking name. He's not sitting there like trying to wait for her and trying to think of things to keep from coming, like giant garbage bags with no food in them or whatever. <laughs> and even if he did, she's on a subway platform in front of people. She's not gonna be able to get to that special place inside, that, that quiet place within herself that girl rats need to find so they can have their orgasm. Because I know what girl rats need. I, I know how to make a girl rat come. I do, you just pick them up and you hold them upside down and you just... You guys were great. Thanks a lot for coming tonight. I hope you had a good time. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm not going to make you do that for a long time. That's rude. I don't know how people have the balls to do that. Like, just wait, and people are like, come on! And after a while, they're like, all right, don't. Well, thank you, you guys. This was, uh, you guys are a really great crowd. Seriously, we were wonderful. And thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. It's been uh, an amazing thing to, to play this room. A bunch of times, Ollie and Fraser fought here, and Led Zeppelin played here, and so I'm, I, I, it's, a, it, it's, it was fun. All right, back to work. So, uh, I had a dream the other night. Uh, I had a dream that I was a little Japanese girl. I did. I'm not usually somebody else in my dream, but in this dream, I was way not me. I was a little seven year old Japanese girl. And I remember I was like walking around and I was scared because there's these guys with swords and they were cutting the heads off of children. And I was like, oh, scared. Oh, it's a man with a sword. I mean, I can't help, it's a dream, I can't help. I dream in black and white and stereotypes, I can't help it. Oh, I'm so scared. And the guys with the swords are like, oh, oh, and they're cutting the heads off of children. I was like, oh. But also, they have these chocolate coconut donuts, and they're eating them. Oh, oh. And I was like, oh. But also, I was like, oh, I want those, I want those fucking donuts. Like the, the real, you know, I wanted to really ask them for a donut, but I was scared of being, having my head cut off. So I guess, I guess it just, I guess it just means be yourself. I think that's, I think that's what the dream meant. That's, that's as much as I can figure out about it. I used to be a very critical person. I don't get upset at other people's actions as much as I used to. You know, and one thing that's made me not so critical is reading people, things on the internet of people getting so angry at each other. Like people that write long articles about how mad they are at a thing that people sometimes do. <laughs> and the articles are very long because they don't have to be short anymore. I think newspapers were a little better because you had to like be careful. Like we only have this much room to tell about a whole war. So you have to be really artful about it, and then anybody who wants the job to write that much has to be really fucking good. But the internet is forever. So you just come and you go, I want to write a story about how like trees are annoying. Totally, just fucking do it, I don't care. <laughs> just write seven years about it. And the, and, the, and the headline of the articles are always something like, it's a whole sentence. It's not like, why trees or something like provocative. It's like, I don't like trees that much, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm just sort of sick of them. So that's what this article is about. And um, I have to pee. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. Okay, I peed. Hi, everybody. Here's the article. But anyway, I was reading this one about a guy who was really upset about people taking pictures of their food at restaurants. And it was one of those where he's like, can we stop with the taking pictures of your fucking food? If I get another Instagram of a fucking appetizer, it's ruining America. I'm like, let her, let her take a picture of her food. Let her do it. She's eating alone. She's by herself. I eat alone all the time. And I'm always eating next to people. If you're eating alone, you're always eating next to people that are together. And by the way, if you're ever with somebody at dinner and there's a person sitting alone right here, they're with you. <laughs> they are in your conversation. <laughs> they're just looking straight ahead at what? At nothing. You really think they're just like, just no, boo. They just, every word you say, they're just gathering it. So anyway, I was at a restaurant and I was listening to these two young women that were talking. And they were about 20 years old, they maybe NYU students. And one is telling the other about the guy she's dating. And she's telling her all the unsatisfactory things about the guy. She's like, I don't know, like I, sometimes I text him and like he doesn't text back right away. And then when he does, it didn't have like anything to do with like what I wrote. I'm like, why do you even write me? 
And then I went to see him, and he's just being weird. And then he wrote me, and he's like, I'm sorry I'm being weird. It's weird right now. And I was like, I didn't even say anything. Why are you even saying anything? It just sounds like when he writes to me. <laughs> but he doesn't really, like, think about, like, what I would want to hear. It just seems like it's just always just So I'm listening to this because I'm interested in what her friend's going to say. I want to I know what kind of friend she has. So after a while, her friend says to her, well, he's just a piece of shit. He's a piece of shit. And he, he, the thing is that you're amazing. You're amazing and he just can't handle it. And I thought, this is not a good friend. Because give your friend something useful. Like, well, maybe you're a bummer sometimes. Maybe you bummed him out because you're a boring bummer. Is that possible? Like, let her consider that. It doesn't help a person to walk around thinking, I'm amazing. And anybody who doesn't text me back right away just can't handle how amazing I am. Like, there's some other NYU kid walking around telling his friends, oh, I'm dating this girl, and she's just, I can't handle how amazing she is. It's like, too much. Like, I try to text her back, but I'm like, I can't, she's too amazing. I just can't handle it. I wish she was less amazing. How is she amazing, by the way? She's like 20, you can't be amazing yet. If you're 20, unless you have some missing limbs, you're not amazing. I mean, what is she, Nelson Mandela already? She's a fucking kid. You're amazing the way you take those classes. Don't, you don't need to walk around thinking that you're amazing. That doesn't help you. It's not a healthy thing. I mean, self-love is a good thing, but self-awareness is more useful to the rest of us, if you can master that. Because it's nice to walk around saying to yourself, I'm amazing, I'm incredible, but really, once in a while, you should say to yourself, maybe I'm a bummer. Maybe I'm a boring bummer. If you don't think that to yourself at least twice a week, you're a psychopath. <laughs> because everybody's capable of becoming a bummer. Of course we are, everybody is. Once in a while you drift over and you realize, oh fuck, I'm kind of a douche right now. <laughs> and you reset your sights. You have to consider the possibility. It's like when you say to a friend of yours, you know, sometimes a friend of yours will be an asshole. He becomes an asshole. And you tell him, hey man, you're an asshole. And he's like, no I'm not. Well that's not up to you. That's up to everybody else if you're an asshole or not. You don't get to just say no to that. You're an asshole. No, I'm not. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm glad I checked. <laughs> Self-awareness is not a great American trait. As a country, we just want what we want, and then we just do shit. America is like a shitty girlfriend. It really is. America is like the worst girlfriend the whole rest of the world ever had. Because whenever something bad happens to America, she remembers it forever. Like it just happened. But if she does anything wrong, she's like, what? I didn't do it. What are you talking about? I didn't do that. But you killed hundreds of thousands of people in, in, in the Middle East. Yeah, but 9-11, okay? You don't even know, assholes. Yeah, but there's this wedding in Yemen and you killed all these... Yeah, but 9-11 still! But now you're torturing people. It wasn't even torture. Oh, my God. He's such a baby. And I'm saying, I'm saying this about women because I'm a guy. I'm the opposite sex. So that's how I'm sure women feel that way about guys. It's just the way it works. That's how we feel about each other sometimes. You know, it's like sexism and racism are very different, I think. Because racism is just like a mistake. M racism has no basis in anything. It's just a weird mistake we made it somewhere along the line, and I'm sure we'll get rid of it at some point. But sexism ain't going anywhere. <laughs> because as wrong as sexism is, it's just too, it's down deep, and it's wired in with lust and love, and when we get mad at you, we get mad at all you, just, oh, women! Women! Women, women! Oh, wi women! Women are women! 
and you're like, men, 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 men. All right, you guys, get home safe. Thanks a lot for coming. Good night. Thank you very, very much.